Well, good evening, any, everyone. We are just going to start this panel, even though that um, we are missing some of the audiences, but that's okay. Um, this is going to be about the civil liberties online, which is, of course, a very broad subject. Um, I want to introduce my panelists. Uh, this is Maryam Marzuki. Uh, she's an academic and a researcher for the French National Center of Scientific Research, if I'm not mistaken. And here we have Regan MacDonald. Um, she is from Access Now, which is a, is a human rights organization advocating for human rights and digital rights in the 21st century. Here on my left, well, on your right, um, is Claudio, no, yes? Claudio. Claudio. Claudio Agosti. Uh, uh, he is a president and a software developer for Hermes Center for Transparency and Digital Human Rights. And um, he has been developing the Global League software, which is um, aimed to achieve um, um, whistleblowing, secure whistleblowing processes. And on the other end, uh, it's Carlo von Lingst, um, an internet activist, yet another internet activist, um, as he wants to describe himself. Um, and he is the founder of the You Broke the Internet um, organization. I think Carlo is probably the best one to explain what that actually is. And I myself, I'm Asta Halkodotter from the Icelandic Pirate Party. I'm a deputy member of the Icelandic Parliament. And uh, I will be the, um, trying to control this, this, this uh, very serious panel. Um, and I was thinking about asking Maryam to, to start off and uh, speak a bit broadly about like civil liberties and what it means to have civil liberties online. So here you go. Thank you, Esther. I have to warn you that we are uncontrollable totally. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be here, although it's not my uh, usual uh, milieu. Uh, but when I was invited to participate to this conference, actually the title of the, the panel was related to uh, an Internet Bill of Rights. And this is actually what I wanted to talk about today, human rights on the Internet beyond civil uh, liberties uh, online, to provide you some uh, background on ongoing uh, efforts for almost two decades now to have it human rights online, to have it recognized that human rights should apply equally offline and online, which is now uh, almost done, mainly thanks to the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on Freedom of Expression, Mr. Franck Larue. And in the framework of this kind of advocacy to define how human rights translate in the internet uh, environment, and maybe most importantly, how they can be actually realized in this environment, and what are the actual recourses and remedies when once human rights have been uh, infringed uh, online. And um, till now, actually, there is no um, generally agreed document or platform on how human rights translate online in practice, I mean. Uh, the universal human rights standards are, of course, well known, but uh, how should they be interpreted in the internet context? That's the main question. Uh, in the international law, states are legally obliged to uh, respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of their citizens. Governments have the primary responsibility for realizing uh, human rights within their jurisdictions. And since the internet is, as we know, a privately ordered, sp ordered space for an important part of it with private gatekeepers, uh, it is crucial to recognize that the duty to protect requires governments to protect against human rights violations committed also by other actors, including businesses. And uh, states are also obliged to take uh, appropriate steps to um, investigate, punish, and redress human rights abuses uh, which take place within their territory or under their jurisdiction, so again. However, other actors also have responsibilities under the international human rights uh, regime. 
and the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights calls on every individual and every organ of society to promote and respect human rights. So while this, these uh, responsibilities do not equate to legal obligations, they do form a part of prevailing social norms which uh, companies and other private organizations, including civil society organizations, uh, should uh, respect. Now, that being said, where are we with the translation of human rights online? Actually, um, big progress um, have been made uh, for five years now, mainly in the framework of the Internet Governance Forum, where a global coalition of different stakeholders, though mainly or most of them are from civil society, uh, they gathered under the name of Internet Rights and Principles Coalition precisely to undertake the development of a charter for, uh, of human rights and principles for the Internet. This document, it exists. Uh, it took actually some years and many heated discussions, almost online discussions, to understand and agree uh, on the content, but also on the limitations on human rights on the internet. And the charter is, is an, evolving, an evolving, living document, not to be signed or adopted as it is, but rather to serve as a platform for more institutionalized efforts at the global, regional, and national levels, including as a means to uh, inform and develop new legislation. Let me just g give you a flavor of the, the charter, which is, of course, available uh, online. It has a preamble, of course, and it deals to right to access to the internet, right to non-discrimination in internet access, use and governance, right to liberty and security on the internet, right to the development uh, on the internet, of course, freedom of expression and information, freedom of religion and belief, freedom of online assembly, privacy, digital data protection, but also right to education on and about the, the internet, and other rights, like cultural rights, right of some uh, categories of uh, people, like children of, or people with disabil disabilities, right to work uh, uh, on the internet, etc., including a right to uh, benefit from an appropriate social and international order for the internet, which includes uh, governance of the internet for human rights, multilingualism and pluralism on the internet, effective participation in internet governance. Uh, now, what does that mean? Uh, let me just take the example, uh, for instance, of freedom of expression and information on, on the internet, which is well known. What does that mean exactly uh, on the internet? It means, according to the Charter, of course, uh, that uh, we uh, must have ensured freedom of online protest, freedom from censorship, right to information through the internet, freedom of the media, freedom from hate uh, speech. And in the same way, all these uh, recognized uh, human rights, all these internationally recognized uh, human rights are uh, in this way um, interpreted to fit the context of, of the internet. And as a response to some people or some group who say that we should go beyond the internet, the recognized international uh, human rights standard, it, uh, uh, it is clear when you read this uh, charter, and this, it is clear from the, the, the process, then that when interpreting in practice, on the ground, this rights on the internet, then you will go be beyond and actually define what we can call new rights, like the right to access uh, to uh, the internet. It also touches on principles like net neutrality, uh, etc. cetera. Um, um, as a conclusion, I participated uh, as a human rights expert to the development of this charter, 
And I was actually very proud to participate afterwards to the group of experts of the Council of Europe that developed a recommendation to member states, you 40, uh, seven or 48 member states on a guide on human rights for internet users. This process ended last year and actually was the first institutionalization process of this charter. The recommendation uh, should be adopted next month by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And this kind, it's not binding like a treaty but still it, it is a very important document because uh, the Council of Europe recommends to member states to uh, uh, translate this kind of recommendation in their own legislation and also as we have seen recently, the European Court of Human Rights uh, takes into account and quotes these recommendations from the Council of Europe in its uh, ruling. Now my uh, hope uh, to finish is that other institutions, uh, first and foremost the European Union, as well as civil society and political parties, and the Pirate Party must be one of them, will also uh, use this work to, to advance the understanding and the respect for human rights online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, you know, inspiring um, description of your work. So, Regan, can I offer you two? Thanks, Asa. Um, so, as Asa mentioned, um, Access is an international organization that defends and extends digital rights of users around the world. We have offices located uh, in several parts uh, around the world, including the United States, uh, in Chile, in Tunisia, um, in Costa Rica, uh, soon the Philippines, and here in Brussels. So I head up our Brussels operations um, and the EU policy manager. Um, we've been focusing mostly on the protection of privacy and personal data, um, network neutrality, and of course against mass surveillance. Um, so Medium today um, outlined the application of civil liberties to the internet um, from more of a government perspective, the government duty to respect or to protect human rights. Um, today I want to discuss the exercise of human rights and the relationship with corporate platforms. So the internet is universal and international and this platform has obviously become vital to our daily lives and serves simultaneously as a platform for education, for creation, knowledge, business, and even management of critical infrastructure. Frank LaRue, the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, has said that the internet is a gateway through which we can exercise human rights. And that includes, but it's not limited to, freedom of expression, <clears throat> access to information, the right to a private life, uh, and freedom of thought. But this space is, for the most part, owned and operated by private corporations. And unlike governments, companies don't have a legal obligation to protect human rights. Even if they want to, they're often placed into compromising positions by powerful political actors. And increasingly, governments are pushing companies to make decisions about freedom of expression and speech online. The reasons behind this are many. Whether it's for the protection of children, the prevention of terrorism, the regulation of hate speech, the enforcement of copyright, or the preservation of cultural values, any decision about speech has clear implications for civil liberties online. And allow me to provide you with an example. Imagine you were running a VPN service. You might want to get paid for this service and start charging a small fee. But one day you'd find that your payment provider has blocked you and stops processing all of your payments. This was exactly the case for a handful of VPN networks operating in Sweden last summer um, who found that their payment services were being blocked. This includes iPredator, an anonymization service launched by Pirate, Party, or Pirate Bay co-founder Peter Sunde, who I think is actually here today. The payment processing giant PayPal blocked their funds and freezing them for up to 180 days. The company never received a notice as to why their service was blocked, and they never received an opportunity to appeal this decision. And according to news sources, 
iPredator was informed by one of its EU payment providers that the company had been put on a mysterious blacklist, where no payment providers, apart from Bitcoin, of course, um, would provide them with service. So how is this possible? Here's a clear case of companies using their control of a market to make decisions that censor people's ability to communicate and receive information anonymously in violation of their civil liberties and human rights. In 2001, the White House, led by intellectual property czar Victoria Espinel, concluded an agreement with major payment providers, including American Express, Discover, MasterCard, PayPal, and Visa. Espinel praised this so-called voluntary agreement between companies as key to changing the paradigm in fighting IP infringements. But because this is an agreement amongst companies and not public policy or law, the terms of the, of the agreement are not public. There is no appeals process for those who find themselves on this list. And there's no public information about why services may be blocked. iPredator was left with very few options of payment providers apart from Bitcoin. They've also considered legal action to get the service unblocked. Um, but this isn't just about payment providers, unfortunately, or anonymization services. This is about platforms and services everyone uses every single day. And these voluntary agreements, where companies agree to police content, processes, and users, are happening with domain, domain name registrars and registries, search engines, hosting companies, and advertising agencies. In 2011, the proposed SOPA legislation had a complete list of companies and services that had signed on to police copyright through so-called voluntary agreements. Luckily, SOPA, along with ACTA, both failed to pass. But because concerned citizens took to the street to prevent these pieces of legislation from harming the open and the free internet. But while these bills are dead, the intentions behind them are certainly not. As a result of the public protest and disapproval, discussions have moved away from relatively transparent uh, legislative processes to secret and undemocratic voluntary agreements. So the question is, why would companies do this? Why would they deliberately limit the rights of their users? There are actually a number of reasons a payment processor, a registrar, or a search engine might voluntarily take measures to regulate speech outside of established law. First, they may have a genuine feeling of responsibility. Google and Microsoft, for instance, recently agreed to alter their search algorithms to block search results that are aimed at finding illegal material that might be related to the sexual abuse of children. They may be concerned about ISP liability regimes. Uh, in many cases, companies are faced with a classic threat from governments. Uh, if you don't do this, we'll regulate and the situation will be worse. In the US, this is exactly what happened with payment providers, but this is also what um, most large ISPs have signed on to uh, and agreed to a voluntary six strikes uh, copyright enforcement mechanism. They may be doing it for public relations. Uh, platforms that operate across countries and in several jurisdictions may feel the need or public pressure to be sensitive about certain cultural contexts. Um, for instance, it's well known that, that Facebook was for, for a long time blocking uh, pictures of women breastfeeding, which had very different reactions uh, from individuals and groups in across Canada, the EU, uh, and the United States. And finally, they may just be under direct pressure from governments. Um, when in 2012, YouTube blocked the controversial Innocence of Muslims video in Libya and Egypt, it was purportedly under direct pressure from the White House. Um, as fatal protests had broke out in the Middle East, even though the content was both entirely legal and completely in line with YouTube's terms of service. So in almost all of these cases, takedowns, blocking, and other actions are not even based on legal decisions. They're based on accusations, on insinuations, and inferences. These practices have a clear impact on our civil liberties online. And when companies are left to decide on our religious freedoms, to act as judiciary and interpret what is legal and what is not, or determine for us what is acceptable political speech and what is not, our rights can and are being restricted. The internet is a tool that offers us unprecedented opportunities to enrich human rights, uh, but it can equally be used as a tool to undermine them. As a society, we must cherish the democratic potentials of these technologies, 
but prevent the decay of our human rights both online and off. And in democratic societies, any restriction of our rights must be foreseen by law and not a voluntary agreement. Law is accountable and public, and it is the foundation of our democracies. So we must... for their actions, and that due process and the presumption of innocence remain the key pillars of our free societies. So to conclude, at the moment, there isn't sufficient discourse on the role of companies in arbitrating our ability to speak. We urgently need serious public discourse and reflection on these practices in order to stop the erosion of civil liberties and the rule of law online. People often argue that this is just a matter of consumer choice that if you don't like the policies of a certain platform, you can just move to another. But this isn't exactly true, because people use popular services because they're good at what they're, they're built for, and that's for staying in touch with people, finding things, managing information. And they do it better than any other service. So there isn't always a viable alternative. And furthermore, companies like Facebook and Google have woven their identity, identity authentication into the fabric of the web which means by opting out of these platforms, you opt out of being able to use many of the services available on the web today. And what about those that are actually imparting information, such as those running VPNs? They should not be subject to arbitrary blockage of services or denied legislative processes either. Even if it were possible, it wouldn't be right. And if you leave those services, literally billions of users will continue to use them. So just like human rights, the internet is universal and we must protect their rights too. As people increasingly rely upon online services for information, it's critical that companies and of all shapes and sizes, but particularly those with the global reach, resist these voluntary type agreements. They must uphold the rule of law and their duty to respect internationally established human rights, such as freedom of expression and access to information. And there's a very clear need to address these issues head on and even work with companies to come up with policies that defend against this type of government coercion. We must reaffirm the neutrality of our platforms and services and to ensure that the rights that we fought for online are equally applicable in the online space. Thank you, Regan, for a very thought-provoking um, lecture. Um, Carlo? Yes. Could you maybe start off by explaining what you broke the internet is? <laughs> Actually, I wanted to pick up some, some thoughts here from uh, Madame Marzuki. Uh, we're, we're very happy that uh, you got the digital civil rights uh, established in the UN. And, uh, uh, and the point uh, of uh, Madame MacDonald uh, is similar about the, the civil rights uh, being, being able to enforce them. And that's exactly the point where we are at because we, we realized that there are several kinds of civil rights infringements on the internet that are just not detectable because they're digital. I mean, the, the medium, it's not like when you open a, a letter, uh, you break the envelope, but uh, on internet packets, they just Flow, flow by and it's just too, so easy to do surveillance. And so um, we have come to the point that there's a community of people that, that believe that we need to have a technological re solution and an approach to legislation that will then uh, enforce such technological solution because as long as it's too easy, it will be too hard to, to defend. And. Um, so, how came uh, you, you broke the internet? Came about uh, just shortly after the Snowden events. Um, uh, we uh, had the uh, occasion to uh, do a, um, a workshop with uh, Mr. Christian Grothoff from GNUnet and uh, myself presenting SecureShare, and uh, we had Richard Stallman and, and Mr. Jacob Applebaum uh, available. So we made this nice event and. Uh, um, to attract more people beyond just the crypto party kind of crowd, uh, we thought about a nice, fun title, You Broke the Internet, We'll Make Ourselves a GNU One. And uh, that kind of caught on, uh, and uh, the, the video of this event was like uh, seen uh, over 100,000 times. And so we realized, whoa, uh, this is uh, an interesting topic. Um, 
uh, we uh, did some uh, workshops, uh, we, actually a group formed. Uh, out of this uh, thing, a group uh, of a dozen people approximately formed, and it's mostly not pirate. Actually, I'm the only pirate, so it's kind of like a non-governmental organization, non-party non organization. And we started organizing workshops at the uh, 30 uh, C3, uh, the Congress of the Chaos Computer Club in Hamburg, which was a huge event and uh, uh, our side Congress went very well. Uh, we're still late releasing the videos, but we're, we're gonna do it soon and I guess uh, that will, that'll contain a lot of uh, disrupting uh, information. Um, so what's the point? Why yet another NGO? What, why, what is different from our point of view? And um, how come uh, there are several people working in that field and that have not been organized so far? We found out that the, our specific point of view on the technology um, has been followed by uh, some crazy paranoids all over the world, and we were considered crazy paranoids. And now that everybody's realizing, oops, maybe that's actually the way we should have been going all the time, uh, now we're, we're kind of uh, also getting the kind of uh, support and, and to, to meet up and discuss how those details of technology should actually function. I'll try to give you a, a look into uh, what this technology is actually about, why it's, what, what makes it different. The, the thing that we want to achieve is, of course, end-to-end -end encryption, perfect for secrecy, but now, uh, one point which is new is the owned storage. It's your own storage. You don't trust some servers, even if you rent them yourself. That has to do with servers uh, usually not being reliable. Um, if you have a renter server, it's probably going to run in some uh, computing center. And uh, if it, when it runs in a computing center, uh, a government could knock on the door and install a permanent way of uh, controlling the content of the server, like uh, just persistent store, uh, control of, of memory, a persistent memory access, and the owner of such a server wouldn't even be able to find out. So maybe it's not happening yet, but it's uh, certainly a scenario for the future that uh, the idea of decentralizing uh, information by just having a server, each of us, is not going to actually work out. That's uh, a one point that kind of makes us uh, nervous. And um, before we start making complicated solutions with servers that run from home and then they are really uh, penalized by the asymmetry of uh, the, the internet connection, which, which would be an interesting point to talk about legislation in changing the symmetry of the internet connection. But um, as long as that isn't a, such a great solution either because only a few uh, interested people would care to have their server at home. Um, the point is to have a different architecture that uh, allows us to use servers in a way that uh, they do not know what's going on, that the servers are just passively doing a job. And we have a good example of a software which is being very successful at that. It's the, the Tor system with the Tor Relay Network. Um, those are thousands of servers which are belonging to a diverse, diverse set of, of people and still they are co collaborating to serve a purpose of anonymization and uh, each of them by itself has no access to useful data or limited access to useful data. But uh, for actually dealing with the entire internet from that kind of perspective or the most of the features that we want uh, on the internet, it takes more than what Tor currently offers. So uh, own storage is, another, is one point and another important point is exactly what Tor is about. It's hiding the social graph, hiding the interactions between people. Um, we think, um, or at least I, I suppose, that it has something to do with freedom as, of assembly. If, uh, if every time people on the internet communicate is well known, then, then you're not, 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 not just uh, not, having, not enjoying secrecy of correspondence, which is one of the basic civil rights for democracy, but we're also having a problem with freedom of assembly if there's no, no easy way to have a group of people collaborate on the internet without uh, surveillance uh, being able to know exactly what is being discussed and prepared and uh, I mean also for a political party it's just uh, um, 
hopeless if uh, to to plan their strategies online using just regular email or something if uh, it can be seen from outside what's going what what the plans are going to be okay i'm kind of mixing up uh, in encryption and not encryption so um excuse me for that uh, the the important or here's an example of something that happened just today um uh, the twitter got blocked in turkey and uh, there has been an initiative uh, to uh, get everyone to use uh, the Google name server so they can circumvent the, the, the national filters uh, for uh, Twitter. And uh, that's a nice example of how uh, Google uh, now gets to see who are the early adopters in, in Turkey. Uh, they just need to check the IP addresses uh, coming in and they get a social graph of uh, who are the interesting people in Turkey. Whenever the, the uh, United States government could make use of that information, now they have it. And they probably had it much longer before, but it's just an example of how uh, quickly and easily uh, this can go wrong. Uh, so that is uh, 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 a major point. It's really important for democracy to hide how the social graph works, and that's the biggest challenge because anti encryption by itself does not solve that, does not address that, and all the uh, endeavors that we've been running so far have not been sufficient. Tor is pretty much the only tool that goes in that direction. So, um, what is the kind of architecture that we're talking about? Um, we're thinking, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, public key-based routing. That's something that as Tor is in, in, in a way essentially doing, at least for uh, when it comes to uh, hidden services and uh, offering services over, the, over Tor. But it must be for when it comes to um, communication between people, the, the best way to be secure that it will end at the right address and at the right person is to not have an address which might be, can be faked the addresses that the new systems use are public keys. That is, you need to be the person and the owner of the key to actually even receive the message. So that makes it a lot more secure. Um, the, the kind of technology which is typically used to um, connect the to find the, the, the actual internet address of a person or to, to uh, send a message to a person over such a network is typically a distributed hash table, which is a, a long discussion to, to, to talk about, but uh, it's a technology that has been around for over, over 10 years. It has seen a lot of attention from uh, the science community, uh, from uh, the university research. So it is way beyond from the stupid mistakes that were done in the early days, which uh, many people still think about. Um, and uh, what is typically done uh, with the data is uh, to create a, a onion routing kind of relay or mesh network, and uh, Tor is not the only one. And, uh, and the interesting new aspect uh, which uh, makes it possible to uh, achieve large systems, uh, scaling systems for with many people participating, um, f at least for some use cases, for some uh, many important use cases, like the social cases mostly, is to have distribution trees. Distribution trees is a, um, a construct which allows you to uh, subscribe to some information that you may, may want to have. The subscription might, might be anonymous or it might be authenticated depending on, on what it is and in, uh, if anybody uh, gets to decide about it. And uh, this is a way that can uh, enable uh, thousands or millions of people to receive a certain information. Like if some uh, video stream uh, from Syria suddenly is very, very interesting, uh, in, the, in the existing internet it would break down and you need a cloud company to uh, stream it or otherwise it fails. And we need an internet that is capable of distributing that kind of video stream to all the recipients independently from any, uh, uh, from not being dependent on any cloud technology. So what cloud technology actually does to achieve that is to have uh, the kind of uh, distribution trees and, and replication technology in the cloud. And we need to, a solution that is free and that does not uh, imply that, um, that that maintains anonymity as you progress along that tree. So that's super technical and super detailed, I'm sorry. Um, 
uh, what I'm saying, okay, I'll mention some projects which are in this uh, field, and uh, uh, you might know the names, Tor, I2P, GNUnet, Freenet, Tribler, RetroShare, Briar. So uh, you might have heard of them as like darknet technology, you might, or you might not have heard of them yet. Um, it's funny that they are being called darknet because actually they are the, the systems that provide proper security, they should be called lightnet. Um, like, I mean, if I uh, was, if I'm communicating with a node on a Tor hidden server, that's actually more secure than accessing my online bank. So, uh, are we doing some priorities wrong here? So, um, like online banking with uh, certificates that can be faked is not very safe that way. So, um, um, all right, so what we are trying to achieve is to have a new foundation for uh, packet routing and messaging and uh, between uh, people and, and computers uh, with this kind of approach. And it goes as deep as, as even changing the foundations of how the internet routes, so we uh, could actually replace the entire internet stack in a long term. Um, and uh, the the early goals that we would like to, to get to is uh, have a new mail system that uh, solves the problems of SMTP even with PGP, it's just not sufficient. Uh, there's no way to fix the existing, e existing email system. Uh, we uh, intend to come up with something that works very differently and works better and is actually safe. And it's like so fundamental because getting messages in and out to, to everybody is something that we need to do all the time. So we need basic mail and messaging functionality. Uh, later we can, can evolve into social networking functionality, which is actually very similar, very related, and it's just um, more detail, more aspects connected to it. So we will actually uh, move in a direction of, of a Facebook uh, kind of thing. And uh, we're also looking, uh, we'll, we're already with things like the Torian services, uh, we're already providing uh, possibilities for businesses to have safer transactions than they currently have with uh, the broken certification system of uh, HTTPS, SSL. And uh, um, what instead is tricky is redoing the web. Because in, in a way, one thing about the web is uh, it has this, um, structure where uh, if you access a website and you want to see a certain page, then you are loading certain uh, pictures and lo loading certain parts of, of the web page in a certain rhythm, in a certain sizes. Uh, that alone can expose your interest and your access to this website, even if you're going through a network like Tor. And uh, we can mitigate these kind of things uh, to a certain point. But uh, the fact that we are still trying to do the web over uh, these technologies is uh, making us more uh, easier to expose. That's why it's, we should be taking as much as possible uh, applications, internet applications, off the web, away from the architecture of having the server somewhere, and uh, trying to get it more distributed and more implemented as a software that runs on everybody's uh, local device. And um, how far am I with time? Mm. Oh, I'm over. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know 10 minutes go so away so fast. Okay, so, uh, um, well, uh, the final note I'll just mention. Yeah, I've, uh, we've been thinking about uh, uh, legislation thing that uh, Jake uh, luckily showed uh, already, uh, which is, uh, the idea of if we impose, like making such a technology at, at, will still remain a thing that a few uh, people start using and that's it. It takes so long until it gets established. That's why we think it needs a double attack vector. You also need to provide or push for legislation that would require this kind of secrecy from any a commercial provider who wants to sell you a telephone, for example. So in the future, if you want to buy a telephone, it must respect these capabilities that would drive the development of these technologies uh, a lot if all the uh, commercial uh, uh, companies, of all the companies have a motivation to invest in this kind of technology. 
and uh, so on. The, so um, you broke the internet. Uh, could use more developers in the single projects or um, on, a, on a more general level. We could use uh, contributors to the, the organization. And of course, we could use more funding. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Hall. I'm trying to create a fear rouge that I link the first uh, two inter inter interview with uh, Carlos Juan. I'm Claudio, I'm working in uh, self-defense technology since uh, a while. And um, I wonder how many of you has understand exactly what Carlo has told to you. <laughs> oh, compliments, <laughs> because you are pirates. But commonly, the common users uh, are not so able and capable to understand the security aspects and, uh, and details and technical details. And that uh, was uh, one of the things I Ouch. first uh, understand when uh, the Snowden effects uh, uh, come out. Because for years uh, we develop uh, secure technology without uh, seeing them uh, actually used. And then uh, when everyone uh, wants this kind of protection, understand that uh, this protection is needed, no one uh, continues to use it, or very few of, of the increment uh, uh, happened. And uh, we wonder why. Well, for two main reasons. The first one is uh, um, political. Mostly because uh, making a uh, protection based on the technology is not a long-term uh, strategical goal valid, because this can bring only technocracy. Technocracy means that uh, a little short of amount of person is capable to protect himself, and the other are not. Therefore, uh, it's not something that uh, we need to figure out uh, for the future. But, uh, there are two elements for, that make this kind of uh, technology approach uh, extremely important. The first one, the law or the policy, will never be global. So we'll ever, ever, we will, will never exist uh, uh, a place where uh, this kind of policies cannot be put uh, uh, and uh, uh, worked. And, and therefore, this kind of technology can solve what the law cannot make and uh, cannot guarantee. And the second one is, uh, uh, well, the threat is, is now. So we need a solution for, for, for now. And this solution needs to be uh, deployed in the most potential and uh, uh, viral way. That is the main reason of the failure of the privacy enhanced technology of the latest year, uh, because uh, they was incapable to reach uh, a large amount of person. And uh, now every user is uh, mostly uh, addicted to some technology like uh, mobile phone and the social networking and those kind of technology uh, was not present uh, when uh, the privacy analysis technology has started to be developed. And this has also provided a change of the paradigm. Therefore, uh, if someone also is totally um, willing to adopt a secure technology and the need to communicate with other person, he cannot upset to uh, stay uh, without a smartphone or stay without a social network. Well, I'm talking about normal people, not about uh, this audience. And uh, that uh, is the important fact. So in order to obtain a sort of political goal, a sort of political shift, we need to uh, reach out to uh, those persons, because those persons are the user. Those persons are the market. Those persons are the person sold by the social network. And those persons are the asset for the telcos and for the over-the-top provider. Therefore, uh, the political goal uh, that can bring some change are uh, that group. So, how many minutes? Five minutes. Okay, don't worry. Uh, that uh, is what I love to call digital self-defense, because it's a human right to be protected, and at the moment, no, no law, no telcos, no provider can guarantee that you are protected, except you choose to use some technology that protects your data. You need to uh, be able to choose if your data needed to go to only one person or to everyone, you need to choose if you, your data need to stay for a, a permanent or, a, or partial for some times. You need to choose, uh, uh, or you uh, want to know who is sending you some data, and you need to be able to identify who is the sources. Will be a website, will be a person. It's still a, a feelings, a right, the right of know my sources. And this applied to the internet is not a guarantee. It's guaranteed only by the uh, technology that also Carlo explained, and uh, the other security technology already and partially in place. What is wrong, anyway? That at the moment, uh, a user that also tried to figure out how to protect himself, in example, feel the urge to say something uh, uh, that uh, perceive a private, and then download uh, a chat software, CryptoCat, or a Jabber with OTR, 
to make uh, encrypted chat. But then is also um, talking uh, about uh, the same things uh, or uh, uh, other related things uh, or with the uh, same persons in untrusted channel. And so this what does it mean? A user needs to, to threat model himself, need to understand uh, which are their, their potential weakness and which are their uh, network of influence and what need to be protected and what can also be unprotected. And this kind of uh, selection, this kind of shoes, is something that commonly is uh, doing by security expert, not by the user. And uh, also, a an user needs to know which are the trusted technology and uh, not just uh, download the first uh, links uh, on, uh, on Google that uh, say, hey, I'm an anonymous software, just uh, take me. Because this is the way <laughs> how the virus is spread, uh, faking an antivirus. So what's uh, uh, the expertise uh, I understand uh, in the latest project I follow, that is GlobalX. In GlobalX, that is a free software uh, aimed for whistleblowers uh, and to create uh, a little, uh, a, a dedicated and uh, localized whistleblowing environment, we figured out uh, that uh, uh, we need, at the best, to guess which are the needs of the user and no more try to make the user aware of our needs. Just, uh, we need to understand uh, what are the uh, category, the kinds of user, and then provide a safe package that uh, contain most of the things that we can uh, put on it. And uh, that is also something that can be strategical for the self-defense technology. In example, uh, what I wish to see in the future and uh, what I was uh, aiming to discuss with you uh, was the creation of a, so a sort of a consortium or a group that can uh, collect the various safe technology like uh, Tor and PGP and Enigmail and uh, Mailvelope and so on, and try to stabilize them, stabilize the communication, stabilize the, the dissemination of uh, those kind of uh, tools, and uh, localize for uh, all the country in the world, and try to offer a stable product for all the operating system, and try to offer uh, some kind of uh, Profiles, so you can not to choose uh, uh, between infinite options, and when you uh, make the wrong option, uh, all your uh, your work your uh, work is lost. That is what uh, is needed, and uh, is what uh, the various uh, software provider like uh, Microsoft and Apple are strong to do it. We are never uh, was never been able to uh, make this kind of effort, and is what I wanna uh, suggest for the future development. And uh, so, just for finish, the political goal that uh, we can uh, um, aim is uh, try to uh, give the, to everyone the capability to protect uh, with end-to-end -end encryption, or uh, give the capability to protect uh, itself from the metadata analysis, but this cannot be done with uh, spare software, wishing that uh, every, pe every person will download it. This can be done only if you are coordinated, like a movement that uh, want to protect uh, digital rights online and uh, uh, have uh, as an answer uh, not only a uh, legal proposal, uh, but also a uh, software that you can download and uh, find the solution uh, with, uh, with them. Thanks. So thank you very much. Um, as far as I could understand, um, this is a question between the limits of the, the technical solutions and political solutions. Um, but officially, um, the schedule for today is actually over. It's 7.30. So I'm not sure if we want to take some questions from the audiences, or maybe we want to just take them outside at the bar. Um, I don't want to force anyone to be here longer than they want to. So do you, does anyone have any very urgent questions, or should we just um, close the session, or do you, the panelists have something? Nadia? Yeah, um, very briefly. Um, so I'm I was involved in founding a, a community that lives online where many of us are, are sharing our experiences of trying to do, or I guess, uh, affect change. And some of the projects are quite radical. I think more than anything, what would be super helpful is stress testing the platforms that are already out there and coming up with practices for the, the participants to be able to manage their own safety. Because do you see this happening or where? No, it's not and it's what I call a stable product. And uh, at the moment, uh, only Tor is a stable product, that's about anonymity, but uh, 
Um, it's not enough. Any other questions or yes? Hi. Um, I want to ask about uh, GlobalX. Um, what kind of technology it uses? Uh, if it uh, um, is a, a sort of hidden service uh, like Tor, or is uh, something yes. more? Yes, by default it's binded on uh, hidden services because uh, it's the only way that uh, you can uh, create a server that uh, is uh, not uh, trackable on the physical location and uh, that guarantee the anonymity of the sources by uh, design in this case. And also... Anyway, okay. we, sorry, <laughs> we have also tried to make uh, hidden services reachable by non-Tor user, and that was one of the efforts to make uh, uh, work in this kind of anonymity technology for uh, the large amount of uh, user. Sorry, continue, please. Yeah, uh, of course, because I was uh, uh, wondering the, the fact that uh, the destinator of the uh, whistleblowing message is also exposed, so the same problem is uh, of the source and also for the destination. Ah, well, uh, in, in our design, the destination is well known because uh, a whistleblower can interact uh, with a well known journalist or someone who uh, he trusts in order to uh, bring the, the message safely. But uh, his, the whistleblower is protected by the fact that uh, before it reaches the global X node, it's passed through the anonymity network. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? No, it doesn't look like that. Um, so um, this is the end of, uh, of today, I guess. I am not going to keep anyone here much longer. Um, so we hope that you enjoyed staying here and had some interesting discussions and conversations and learned something. Um, all the PPU founding session and all the talks will be uploaded on the europeanpirates.eu. And uh, there is an event this weekend as well for, from the Europe, young European pirates. And uh, there will be a party, like, just outside the parliament at uh, Platz Lux, um, the grape wine, is it called, organized by the Belgian Pirate Party. So if you want to go and continue having interesting conversations about life, universe, and everything, I think I will just see you there. So thank you very much.